Okay. Um, we, we see um, the, the notes at the slides. So I think you shared the wrong window. Maybe you close it again and share it again. Then we should. Um... Sure. Let me. Um... Yeah. Okay. I'm going to need to unplug the screen. Let's see how that goes. Give me a moment. All right. So let me try that again. Is that better? Yes, now it's fine. Now I have to check something here in sight so that we, that we just see you. I pin. Yeah, I think we have a great setup now. We can see you, we can hear you. We see your slides on site and online. And yeah, I'm very happy that you're here, Alyssa, and we are very excited uh, for to listen to this, this amazing keynote about your work and you have the stage. So, good morning, good abend. Ich möchte Natalie Denk Duncan, and I'll switch to English now, for this invitation to speak at this wonderful conference. Um, it's really exciting to be here with developers and game scholars and to be able to participate virtually, even if this is a little early for me in the morning. Um, I'm sorry I can't see you all in the room, but I'll, I'll see you after when there are questions. Um, we each approach game studies in different ways, and I'm probably the only Haitian historian here having just written this book, Slave Revolt, on screen. So I'm going to explain what it is that I do as a Haitian and post-colonial historian in the field of game studies and what I have found on issues related to play, oppression and freedom in the games that I study. So I'm going to tell you first some more, hi everyone, about the Haitian revolution. Then I'll explain how I came to this research on video games. Um, even though it's not typical among historians in the US, and I did face some resistance to studying games. Um, I'll discuss what I found in video games on slavery and the Haitian Revolution. And then I'll look um, forward toward other games now invoking Haitian revolutionaries. And finally, if I can still have you awake after a long, rich day of papers, I'm going to raise some general issues about what challenges lay ahead in playing about freedom and oppression and in truly decolonizing games. Um, just a sample of the questions that I'll ask, why has the Haitian Revolution started to become a recurring theme in games? Um, in what ways do games like the ones I will study help preserve the memory of slavery and of the courage of enslaved people fighting against an oppressive system? In what ways do these games distort this history and also what have games meant um, to players whose history this is. So now I'm gonna exit the slideshow, stop the share for the moment so that I can see you all a little better. Um, and I'm gonna tell you first, what was the Haitian Revolution? The Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, long forgotten outside of Haiti, was one of the major events of modern world history, taking place in what was then a French colony called Saint-Domingue, the revolution was the first uprising of enslaved Africans in the New World to succeed in creating an independent state. The revolution sent shockwaves throughout the Atlantic world. For enslavers in the US, Europe, and Latin America, the revolution conjured up a terrifying alternate universe in which whites could lose their property and their lives. For enslaved people, in contrast, the Haitian Revolution served as a beacon of hope. The Haitian Revolution helped birth modern egalitarian ideals that all humans are equal, no matter their skin color, against other revolutions of the time which declared these ideals but maintained slavery. Uh, the Haitian Revolution took place in the western part of Hispaniola, which the French had seized in the 17th century and called Saint-Domingue. Saint-Domingue became the world's richest colony. However, that prosperity came at a price. The colony's wealth depended on the labor of kidnapped Africans, 
transported across the Atlantic to work on plantations. San Domingue slave owners were among the most brutal in the Americas. By forcing enslaved people to do backbreaking labor, they gained enormous profits. San Domingue was the Atlantic world's largest producer of sugar and coffee. As Carolyn Fick has noted, slave resistance took numerous forms in the colony, from maconage, running away, to suicide, since the chances of armed rebellion were slight and attempts at open resistance were met with unspeakable brutality. How then did revolution erupt in this brutally oppressive society? As conflict broke out in the colony, as the French Revolution began in 1789, between whites who supported the monarchy and those who supported the French Revolution, free people of color in Saint-Domingue contested the racial discrimination they faced. However, despite the French Revolution proclaiming all men are born free and equal, slavery and racial discrimination continued. And amidst this unprecedented conflict among whites and free people of color, enslaved people launched their freedom struggle, seeing this as an opportune time to win their freedom and deploying violence back against the same system that had used it so cruelly against them. Their revolution, which we call the Haitian Revolution, began in Northern Haiti, Northern Saint-Domingue in August, 1791, and soon spread to the rest of the colony. Enslaved Haitians battled for their freedom, resorting to violence to win it when France refused to free them, though you may have heard that the National Convention in France belatedly acknowledged the freedom that Haitians had won um, in an abolition decree a few years later in 1794. But in 1802, Napoleon sent armies to reimpose slavery in Haiti. Haitians fought back and in 1804, ejected Napoleon's armies and declared independence. All right, so that's the necessary history lesson. I'm going to go back to my slideshow now, and hopefully that will help you. Okay, let me just page ahead here. All right, we were here. So um, some of you might already know this information about the Haitian Revolution, but others might be hearing about it for the first time. And if that's the case, that begs the question, why is there less knowledge about the Haitian Revolution than other historic revolutions? In um, the late Haitian anthropologist Michel Rolf Trouillot's words, why has the Haitian Revolution been silenced? This is a question that I've been working on for about 20 years, the gap between what happened in the Haitian Revolution and the way it's remembered. Okay, so now that I've given you some background on the Haitian Revolution, let me move to how I started to study video games, even though this is still uncommon among historians in the US, and I did not start my career as a game study scholar. So I'm trained as a historian of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. My first book was the history of a famous man, the French revolutionary priest, Abbé Grégoire. Um, but the book was still unconventional, even though it was kind of traditional uh, subject, in that I wrote about him not just to celebrate him, what we call here great man history, but to use him to think about how modern nation states think about cultural difference and who gets to count as a citizen, which is obviously a very relevant issue in Europe as in the US. Um, and that book also looked at Gregoire's relationship with the first leaders of independent Haiti. My second book, Haitian History, New Perspectives, went deeper into Haitian history from the French colonial period to the 21st century. Um, it also gave a deeper perspective on how Haiti has come to be so impoverished and what was the role of foreign countries from France and the US to Germany in causing that poverty and helping to deny real sovereignty to Haitians. So since then, I've continued to write about the difference between what actually happened in the French Revolution and the amnesia or distortions about it. And this is a slide that I've made depicting one of the core concepts in Trouillot's book, Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History, that highlights 
um, the difference between history and memory. All right, I'll come back so I can see you all again. Okay, so first I'd been working. So again, how do I get to games? First, I'd been working on erasures of the Haitian Revolution in curricula in education in France and elsewhere, and the relative absence of the story on screen. In particular, I had been writing about film and the difficulties that wealthy film studios seem to have had in deciding to portray this story on screen. Um, in the US and in France and, and in cinema elsewhere, revolutions and wars have been staples of big budget epic films. Uh, and numerous dramas have been made on the American, French, Russian, and Chinese revolutions. However, even though scholars increasingly recognize the importance of Haiti's revolution in creating modern ideas of freedom, there has still been no true epic film on the topic. So what was it about this story, I asked, that seemed to make it radioactive for Hollywood funders and for Parisian funders? And I, I discovered in my research that there had been no shortage of efforts to make films on the Haitian revolution by Hollywood and other world cinema legends, whether they were black or white. But I found that Hollywood studios tend to fund films on black history in general and on slavery in particular, only when there is a friendly white person in whose shoes white audiences and white executives uh, can be seen to imagine themselves. So Hollywood films in which African descended slaves are liberated peacefully with the help of a white hero have predominated over those that would show enslaved Africans rising up to obtain their freedom through violence. Even though violence by white revolutionaries is generally celebrated in cinema as heroic and necessary to overcome oppression. So because the Haitian Revolution storyline features violence by African descended people with no clear white heroes, projects on the Haitian Revolution have failed to obtain funding. So I situate the problem of making a Haitian Revolution epic film within the larger issues of structural racism in Hollywood. Now, because I want to get to games very quickly, I'm not gonna go into detail on French problems dealing with the memory of slavery and how this has affected French film funding. But I should just mention one detail, that the one major film in France about the Haitian Revolution, a TV miniseries about the revolutionary leader Toussaint Louverture, really whitewashes and sugarcoats slavery um, and suggests that it wasn't violent and that enslaved people, their life was fine. So this is a context that's important for how I evaluate games on this topic. Okay, so now with that background, we're on to the main topic, games. How did I add games to my study of other treatments of the Haitian Revolution in public culture and in memory culture? So I myself have not been a gamer since I was a child. To paraphrase the late rapper Big Pun, I'm not a player, I just think a lot. Um, I was ahead of the curve in the late 1970s when I gamed on teletype machines that my father brought home from work, but I haven't been a gamer recently. But 10 years ago, a student who knew that I was working on films and is now a game developer told me, there's a new game on what we're studying, Dr. S, which was slave resistance in Saint-Domingue. He was talking about Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry, um, which told the story of a group resisting slavery in colonial Haiti. And I could not believe, given the context I've told you about film, given the absence of this story in Hollywood and the resistance to making films on slave revolt, that a game had been made to examine what happens when a formerly enslaved person, shipwrecks from Trinidad, lands in colonial Saint-Domingue, joins forces with Maroons, and starts assassinating enslavers to free enslaved people. Unlike the French TV miniseries and other foreign films invoking the Haitian Revolution, Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry did not whitewash slavery. Rather, it introduced players to the cruelty of enslavers 
And it also put the player in the shoes of a formerly enslaved person engaged in retributive Black violence against evil enslavers and with no white heroes in sight. And this was not a cheap game to make, even as downloadable content for the main Assassin's Creed um, for a game, but one from a major studio, Ubisoft. So all of that made me want to work on this game alongside the films I was studying. But I need to explain that it was a strange topic for a US-based US historian like me to work on, since our field has traditionally um, ignored video games and there has been relatively little research by US-based historians on games. Indeed, just as historians once found film too trivial to be worthy of study, the American Historical Association has had very few panels at meetings on video games. It never ran an article in its journal, the American Historical Review on Games, until 2021. And this is in contrast to fields of literature, sociology, and media studies, where it has become much more common in the US to study games. And so I did face some resistance from colleagues at first. They did not understand that there were substantive games on historical topics. Some feared that I would be normalizing the trivialization or gamification of an important topic like slavery by paying attention to it. Um, one important publisher of slavery-related scholarship told me they would love a submission from me on films about the Haitian Revolution, but absolutely not on video games. Um, however, given the existence of these games related to slave revolt, it seemed to me to be essential to study them. Um, I luckily found an amazing and forward-thinking publisher to share my research, the University Press of Mississippi. The editor there, Katie Keen, was also a gamer, and she thought game studies was serious work and wanted to make the press a home for it alongside their other specialties in slavery, film studies in the Caribbean. Um, but to my historian colleagues, I still had to explain that historical games, whether on slavery or other topics, wouldn't disappear just because historians ignored them. Um, and I argued gamers um, interested in history want guidance in choosing nuanced titles instead of horrifying distortions. Indeed, whether any of us think it's a good idea or not, Depictions of slave revolt in games like Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry exist, and they've reached millions more viewers than any films related to the Haitian Revolution, let alone the books that my colleagues and I write. So I think I've been making some headway um, since my book came out. The American Historical Review did a podcast interview with me, um, and I've been asked to do far more talks on this book than for either of my first. Okay, let's go back to the slideshow. Okay, um, so what did I find in, let's stop that there, what did I find in my research on games and slavery in the Haitian Revolution? Okay, first, there are many horrible offensive games that treat slavery, including supposedly educational games. There is an infamous 1993 game, Mex Freedom, which had characters speaking Black English and which was eventually banned from schools, as well as a 2013 edu educational game called Playing History to Slave Trade, which was nicknamed Slave Tetris. Um, and games like these, I argue, fulfill the worst fears of critics that treating slavery in video games is pointless at best and harmful at worst. However, I also found games like Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry, which are better than many of the films I looked at. They lead players to empathize with Haitian revolutionaries, and they do not pretend that white enslavers were kind and generous. All right, I am going to um, share some clips with you. Let me get them lined up. Okay, so I'm going to show you some clips from Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry. Um, the first is from when 
Adewale, who is from Trinidad, washes up on Saint-Domingue, and you will see what he sees right away when he gets there. to offer but thanks nothing else is needed as a boy i fled the same fate all right i'm going to show you one more clip from later in the game <clears throat> where um Adewale has now uh been united with people leading resistance on the island um there was a slave ship that they were trying to free the people on and the french enslavers preferred to let Everyone on the ship die rather than to allow them to be free. Um, and the uh, resistors are now mourning um, the loss. Gouverneur de Fayette. I thought I understood his indifference. I did not anticipate the extent of his heartlessness. You tried to warn me. We are all guilty. A governor will pay with his own life. My creed demands that I see to it. C'est la main. C'est raté. Revenge is called comfort. Once the fire is gone, another tyrant will take his place. His death must give this generation of warriors hope. They must not abandon the goal of independence. And the death of these souls? So, they lead new life. We will always mourn them. All right, that gives you just a taste of the game. And when I'm talking about film and games, I like to contrast that to some clips from the French Toussaint Louverture miniseries, which are completely different. Here we see the cruelty of enslavers, um, and we understand why people um, in Haiti would have been revolting. Um, and this game was inspired not only by interviews with Haitians in Canada, but was also made in collaboration with a leading Canadian specialist on the Haitian Revolution, Jean-Pierre Le Glonec, who was eager to see enslaved peoples humanized and to make the game as accurate as possible. Now, as a historian, I have to say that there are certainly errors in the game. First, it's rooted in something entirely fictional, the war between the Templars and assassins, which lies at the core of the Assassin's Creed series. Second, the timing of the game is off. Um, the game claims to be set in a time of turmoil, when enslaved people in Maroons conspired to begin an uprising against their enslavers. But this first happened in Saint-Domingue, not in, 17, in the 1730s when the game is set, but in the 1750s. There are also other glaring errors, such as an actor reading his line in the script about the loi, um, spirits in Haitian Vodou, which is spelled L-W-A, and pronouncing it Iowa, as if that was an I and there was no one on the production who knew enough to fix it. 
So for all of these reasons, the game might be discounted by historians as worthless. Um, for me, however, as a historian in game studies, it's more important to think about a game's larger themes than to focus on minor details. This grows out of the film uh, and history scholar Robert Rosenstone's approach to films, which I adapt for games. And Rosenstone criticizes what he calls a dragnet, which was a detective TV show in the US, a dragnet approach, just the facts, ma'am, um, in which a scholar would look at the details and say, hmm, wrong, 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 wrong. Hmm, this film isn't any good. Everything is made up. Um, Rosenstone argues that film and text are different mediums and that film can't be judged by the same standards as monographs. He argues that inventing details and compressing things to simplify them to fit into the time frame of a film are necessary and that we should judge them by how well they bring to life the historical process they're describing or make visible and tangible things that text can't. So rather than catalog every factual error, I follow Rosenstone in thinking about early uh, larger issues when I study games. First, I consider whether resistance by enslaved people is celebrated or ignored in games like this, and whether games on slavery dehumanize or lead players to empathize with enslaved people. I also borrow from literature and anthropology to see, just a moment, what games mean to those who play them. These are some quotes, let me move this down. Some quotes from Evan Narcisse, um, who's Haitian American and was a um, game critic and now has become a developer. Um, so he wrote in 2017 after he played Freedom Cry that it was so moving for him seeing this history of his on screen when previously he had not um, been able to do it. Let me just fix this share so that I can see you all too, because I still have it set up from video where I cannot see anyone. And good. All right, good. Now I can still see you in the room. Um, so Narcisse, and then let's go again from current slide. Okay. Um, Narcisse noted also that hearing characters talk in Haitian Creole in the game was really unexpected um, and had an emotional resonance reminding him of his childhood with family and community. So overall, I argue in my book that Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry is better in showing ongoing resistance by enslaved people in Haiti than in many foreign films about the revolution, which offer a simplified narrative that enslaved people were happy and content with their condition until they suddenly heard after 1789 the concepts of liberty and equality from the French and decided that they wanted freedom too. You see this game, which is set in the 1730s, shows that enslaved people had always resisted their condition. All right, so I think it is better than films, but there are still some critiques that I share with others. Um, indeed, though Narcisse loved many things about Freedom Cry, he still had some reservations about it. For instance, he expressed qualms after considering that the game's mechanics essentially has the player treating freed slaves like a resource to purchase stuff. That mechanic is uncomfortably close to the way that slaves were used in the bondage that players are supposedly freeing them from. Similarly, game scholar Suvik Mukherjee noted that in Freedom Cry, as in Ubisoft's Far Cry 2, the ostensible act of liberation from the bondage imposed by the elite actually becomes a mechanism of generating in-game capital. The Haitians who performed on the soundtrack for Freedom Cry also expressed some ambivalence. I was able to identify and speak to the singer that you heard in that first clip I played. Um, this is Manvalino Alexi, um, who is a Haitian singer living in New York. Alexi had been told very little about the project that he was hired to sing on. And when the game came out, he was disappointed by its fictionalized treatment of Haitian history, he told me he wished that it had focused on real history and focused on the Haitian revolution and its heroes instead of making up people in the 1730s. 
And for me, even though I think that on balance, the game is still important for bringing the subject of the Haitian Revolution and slave resistance to players who don't know about them, my biggest critique as a historian is that the game is a first person or technically third person shooter or stabber game, which is anachronistic when representing a time when enslaved people's recourse to open violence was rare because they couldn't access weapons and because of the brutality that faced them if they tried. And while departures from fact are expected in games, as I've said, as a Rosenstonian, I find this particular invention significant since it distorts the player's sense of what kinds of options were available to enslaved people, even though it's obviously counterfactual. So it is for this reason that I was thrilled to discover some mostly forgotten games created by descendants of slavery themselves from the French Caribbean from the late 1980s. At a time when the memory of slavery was suppressed in France, these developers chose the new technology of games as a valuable way to present the history of their ancestors to other French citizens not descended from this history. And I do think it matters when the developer is of Caribbean descent. Um, in fact, one of my favorite writers in the world, Patrick Chamoiseau, had written um, video game text and co-written these games, something that had been ignored in all of the scholarship on his writings. And I was delighted to discover his collaborator in this work, Muriel Trami, um, who Elijah Lee has confirmed was the world's first black woman game designer. So they made a game called Freedom in 1988, which was set during the time of slavery. In Freedom, in contrast to Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry, the player is not an outsider coming onto a plantation and using anachronistic means to do things that enslaved people at the time could not have, but an enslaved person on their own plantation using more historically accurate modes of resistance to win freedom and facing more typical obstacles, um, which I'll get to in a moment. So um, the game also emphasized that women as well as men fought against slavery and it had an equal number of male and female avatar choices based on real enslaved people. Mackendall was the leader um, of resistance in San Domingue in the 1750s. And the kinds of complaints that people like Narcisse and Mukherjee have made about the mechanics in Freedom Cry are not present here. Um, here is just a screenshot of Shamwaza written into the game um, as an enslaved person who's afraid um, to rise up because he is concerned um, that it will disappoint his master. This might just be what he's telling someone, right? Because he doesn't want to get in trouble. Um, in the game, the choices that you have are things that are more clandestine, setting a house on fire, picking a lock. Um, but what awaits people in the end often, because it's very hard to win, are dogs. And this was a real um, terror that faced enslaved people all of the time um, if they thought of revolting. Okay. So. I want to move now to my second to last section um, that these are not the only games on the Haitian Revolution, Freedom Cry and Freedom. Since I focused in my book uh, on those two, I've realized they aren't the only games that have focused Haitian revolutionary characters. In fact, Haitian revolutionary characters seem to be recurring a lot lately. Um, and the studios have tried to make more diverse games, ones that aren't centered exclusively on white male protagonists. The revolution seems to have become a convenient stand-in for talking about resistance to oppression, as well as an easy way to bring Black playable characters into historical games. So Rockstar's blockbuster Red Dead Redemption 2 featured a heroic Haitian named um, Hercule Fontaine, who works with the gang while he seeks to free Haitians who have been enslaved. <clears throat> Blizzard's Overwatch added a Haitian character in 2019, Jean-Baptiste Augustin, a medic and ex-mercenary, quote, uses his skills to help those whose lives have been impacted by war, end quote. And also in 2019, Blue Bites Anno 1800 
includes a former slave colony named High Mountain, which is the exact translation of the Arawak Taino word, A-I-T. Um, the game features an African descended non-playable character from High Mountain named Jean La Fortune, who escaped a life of slavery to become the leader of a fledgling nation on the isle his people call High Mountain. And just this year, a new game came out from the Parisian studio, Spiders Games, <clears throat> Steel Rising, which centers the memory of slavery in its story, which I think is significant for a French game. It includes the real Haitian revolutionary figure, Julien Raymond, who was a spokesperson for the free people of color, in its story about Louis the 16th and the revolutionaries using robots against each other. Um, I just live streamed this on um, the Ludo History Channel with Adam Bierstadt. And I want to thank our own Katrina Kiefer for first connecting me with Adam and letting me know that this game existed. All right, so what is the future? Um, I wanna pose a few questions before finishing. Will diversification continue in games? Do Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry and Freedom solve all of the problems of trying to play slavery? And what inequalities still exist in who has the power to design such games? Um, we already know that many major studios are starting to back off. Um, Jill Murray, who had been the developer of Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry at Ubisoft, um, tweeted, I, I uh, don't want to put it on my screen because she didn't write back to me in time and she had deleted the tweet. And I just wanted to see if it was okay to share. I'll just tell you briefly that she said in 2020, in the summer, that Ubisoft started to change its position and started to not um, want there to be protagonists who are not straight white males. Um, and she ended up leaving the company over this. Um, and I think this was part of the backlash inspired by Gamergate. Um, I think there is more hope, perhaps, for independent efforts. Um, I'm currently um, writing about Blackhaven, which is a game created by scholars at UConn and Xavier University <clears throat> with UConn professor James Coltrane Studio Historiated Games. I think I have time to show you a very short, less than one minute clip. So let's do that again. We're going to come here. Um, this is a game in which you don't play slavery. Instead, okay, I need to just get out of here for a second. Let me just put myself on the right screen. Okay. In this game, you play as a college student, <clears throat> um, a black college student at a historically black college and university um, who goes and has an internship in a plantation museum. And she sees the contrast between the happy face put in the front of the exhibits, which convoke a kind of nostalgia for these grand houses and what she finds when she sneaks into the back room. The mechanics are a lot slower <clears throat> than Freedom Cry, but this way you're gonna get to see the document that she finds in the back. Maybe some of the other missing pages are in here. God damn, he beat a mother in front of her child and then needed a nap? I knew Thomas was sketchy, but this is messed up. All right, so again, what I love about this game is that it examines the gap between what happened and how we present what happened without recreating the violence of slavery. Um, the larger issue, okay, let me come back to my PowerPoint and still be able to see you all. <clears throat> all right, um, the second point is how can you treat a serious subject in a medium um, that depends on play? And I think that there are larger issues that Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry 
um, and freedom did not yet resolve. <clears throat> so in his 2022 article, Decolonizing Play, um, the game scholar Aaron Trammell explores recent work in decolonial game studies to raise larger questions about whether the expectations that we have of play in a game are inherently colonialist rather than just being part of particular mechanics. Trammell argues that first, while we talk about decolonizing games by having different kinds of characters and stories, more diverse ones, we also need to think about how our modern ideas of play were constructed in the context of imperial capitalism. And building on Suvik Mukherjee, he notes, quote, were programs sold and distributed within the auspices of imperial taste. Second, building on Meghna Jayant, Trammell notes, the connected histories of games and colonialism have produced a context where the pleasures of many games are colonial pleasures. They assume that the player and the player's agenda are so exceptional that all acts of violence, coercion, theft, and subjugation will eventually be forgiven, if not rewarded, through play. Players are rewarded with pleasure when they subjugate others and exploit the resources around them. Um, before I go to the next slide, I'm just going to say, I can't go into depth in this article. I recommend that you read it. Um, it's an open access. And finally, Trammell discusses Omari Akil's medium piece um, from 2016, warning Pokemon Go is a death sentence if you are a Black man. And this is Trammell. Quote, in the piece, Akil explains why he doesn't feel safe walking around aimlessly at night trying to capture Pokemon. He lists the statistics that show how much more likely it is for him and other black and brown men to be hassled or even shot by the police if they are perceived as loitering. Akil's essay encourages readers to denaturalize the idealistic and naive assumptions about freedom and unencumbered action that play ordinarily connotes and to realize that play as a concept is racialized and born from an ideology of colonialism, end quote. Um, Trammell and the other scholars he cites challenge us to realize that the very idea that you have agency to explore and act in a game is born of colonial ideologies and something more foreign to women and people of color than to white men. So I would argue that it's important for us to take up these questions prompted by Trammell's work. So building on him, I close with a few questions. What would it mean to have a game that had decolonized mechanics as well as decolonized storylines, like the ones that I study that are about the Haitian Revolution, but still have similar mechanics? Second, how can we treat topics like slavery in a genre defined by play and fun, even as developers collaborate with historians to make more serious games? But finally, the most important question, I think, who gets to make, fund, and distribute games to global audiences? Who gets to control what kinds of stories are gamed and how these stories are told? I argue in my book, Slave Revolt on Screen, that the economic legacies of colonialism and slavery has shaped who has game and film capital now and how this warps what the public knows about history. So descendants of enslavers and colonizers have more power to tell history on screen, whether in film or in games, than people descended from those enslaved or colonized. I think that developers in the global north must grapple with this issue if they want to make more socially responsible games rather than just brainstorming themselves. Most of us at this conference are from the global north, so we can talk amongst ourselves about how to make better games about others' histories, or we can use the funding that we have to invite scholars and developers from other countries to write and develop games meaningful to them. Um, I think that we reproduce colonial, okay, uh, we reproduce colonial ideologies otherwise in saying that we are better equipped to tell their stories because they are unable to do so. Um, and with that, I hope I've given you a lot of food for thought and I will stop there. Thank you so much for your attention after a long day.